welcome to the Boston Roll channel. If you want to support my daily Eternal Magic offerings while getting amazing perks like the Boston Roll Discord community, have me play your deck on the channel, or list inside more guides before tournaments, check out the Patreon or YouTube membership program. This channel is possible because of these amazing sponsors. Check them out, all their links are in the video description. As always, thanks for being here. Let's go play some Magic. Hello everybody, welcome to my Eternal Weekend Prague tournament report. If this is your first tournament report with me, basically I just go through my Twitter thread from the tournament and do my best to recall what happened. I want to start by shouting out 3 for 1 Trading. They sponsored me to be at this event. I would not have been there without them. They're an awesome place. Shop.3for1trading.com And this video is coming out on Black Friday. They're running a Black Friday sale all week. And if you're watching this today, I believe Power 9 is what is on their specific sale. Make sure to check that out. Been running hype ads all week for them, and today is the day. Get in there. But yeah, I went to Prague in the Czech Republic for Eternal Weekend Europe 2023. Legacy Main Event and Vintage Main Event are the two things I played in. And we'll start with Legacy, because that one went first. We'll start with my deck. This is Dark Bant Calf Beans. This list is posted publicly on my Mox Field. It was on my Patreon Mox Field before the event. If you're interested in what I'm doing, Eternal Weekend North America is coming up. Make sure you're in the Patreon if you want to know what I'm up to for that. But here's the, the deal with this deck. Triumph of St. Catherine is a very powerful magic card. And she happens to trigger... Beans, up the Beanstalk, powerful engine, doesn't need any introduction at this point. And just being a four-color deck that gets pretty easy access to Leyline Binding, Force of Will, Triumph of St. Catherine, and Murktide Regent. The draw engine is there. Prismatic Ending you can overpay for and draw it, extra cards in the mid-game or in Reveal, draw four or five cards, whatever, with that, with a couple of Beans in play. And the black splash here is for Orcish Bowmaster, which in addition to obviously just being freaking Orcish Bowmaster, is one of the best answers to an enemy Orcish Bowmaster, which is one of the more frustrating cards for Bean Strategies. I'm also a big fan of Thoughtseize in my control decks. This is just really good against combo and versus against control mirrors. I love this tool. I love having access to this. And I had two in the main for this event. Witherbloom Command, very cool tool from the old Dark Band days. And it's extra good now because it kills enemy beanstalks, which is really important for the bean mirrors. If you have a beanstalk and they don't, they're going to die pretty quick. You hit your land drop, you kill a small creature, you destroy an Aether Vial, destroy a Chalice of the Void. Witherbone Command does a lot. Then in the sideboard, we get what I believe one of the best position sweepers right now, which is Pernicious Deed. This is just so good against basically anyone who wants to win with permanence, which seems like a large swath, and that's because it is. Pernicious Deed is from the olden days where they worded cards differently. It reads, destroy each artifact, creature, and enchantment with converted mana cost X or less. It doesn't say non-land, so sweep up Urza Saga, artifact lands, anything that came out of a saga, every elf, every goblin, every beanstalk, uh, unfortunate that we play our own, but in a Beanstalk Mirror, if you know this is coming down and they don't, you can play it around it. Just a lot to like about Pernicious Deed right now. The big question mark about this deck is that Triumph of St. Catherine doesn't exist on Magic Online. That continues to be hung up in, I don't know if it's litigation or just negotiations or what. It's not the Magic Online team that can't figure out how to program these. It's wizards that can't figure out to get how to get permission to do that from the Warhammer folks. So this thing is hanging in limbo, but I did have enough paper events to test that it was awesome. And I really think it is a reasonable top end for a bean deck. And you'll notice that I am a blue green deck and not playing Uro. And that's because up the Beanstalk plus Triumph of St. Catherine does a pretty good Uro impression for the card draw part of it. And Triumph is just much better than Uro when you're slightly behind or at parity and just need to bust a game open. 
I had a game at Star City Pittsburgh where my opponent had three Orcish Bowmasters and an Orc Army 4-4 in play to my two lands. And I just miracle to Triumph of St. Catherine, stabilized, and then started winning. And Uro would not have done that in that spot. Triumph doesn't care about Pyroblast, Caracas. It cares about Graveyard Hate a little bit when it dies, like the Death Trigger, but that they have to answer it first, so whatever. It doesn't care about Graveyard Hate in the same way that Uro does, certainly. I really like Triumph's position in the metagame, and I think I will continue brewing with Triumph Beanstacks for Eternal Weekend North America. I haven't locked anything in on that, but I do like this card at least. We'll get into my played games and the details in a minute, but I actually think the Black Splash did not work out well for this event. These are all cards that I like in theory, but I think my a combination of maybe the metagame at large, but certainly the pairings I paired into, they were not great matchups for these black cards, and they were frequently matchups where having to support four colors worth of spells was tough. And being straight Bant or straight Bug are both options you could take this deck and slim down the mana requirements while still having a lot of the shell still intact. Pokemoki just won the Magic Online Challenge last weekend with just straight Bug. But again, that's an environment where Triumph of St. Catherine doesn't exist, so maybe straight Bant. Bant is better for paper. I don't know. I'll explore that in the coming weeks. But this was my deck. I still think the strategy is good. I think Up the Bean sucks good. I think Triumph of St. Catherine's good. You just got to figure out what your flex slots are and how your mana base is going to support it. And I think that's a recipe for success. Okay, let's check out these matches now. Free for One Trading's Black Friday sale is live now until Monday. Their entire inventory is 5% off, and they offer free worldwide shipping on all orders over $500. Today, they are having an additional sale on selected Power 9 cards. Happy Black Friday, everyone. Wow. This sale is on top of their Black Friday sale, and supply is limited. Visit shop3 one tradingcom to learn more. First off, I started the day with a uh, accountability check. This is really important because I mentioned SCG Pittsburgh during when we were talking about the deck there, and something really shitty happened at SCG Pittsburgh, which is I went 5-0 in a seven-round event. I thought I'd be able to draw in, but then I got paired down, and I was not able to draw in, and then I lost the pair down, and I was so tired and hungry from not sleeping enough the night before and not getting lunch when I should have. I was counting on the those two handshake rounds to get through and have a nice lunch break before the top eight, and then I agreed to draw, after that loss without looking at the standing because I was just very tired and hungry and I ended up drawing myself into ninth. So I resolved to do better for myself on the external game stuff for this tournament. And I went to bed around 10. The rest of my Airbnb wasn't even home yet. I stayed in an Airbnb with 12 other people and there were two showers and it didn't end up being a problem, but I just really wanted to make sure that I was in bed or early enough that I could get up early enough, get one of the showers while there was still hot water left, and then get to the venue with no time to worry about breakfast or anything. And I did succeed in all of those things. I was pretty aggro, actually, the whole weekend about going to bed on time, and to the detriment of my social life, probably. But, I mean, I'm only kind of there to socialize. I have the whole day, the whole event to socialize. I'm not there to go out. Uh, some members of my Airbnb came home at 6 a.m. the first night we were there. They were really just out enjoying the Prague nightlife. And that's cool if you're on vacation, but that's not really what I'm there for. And don't worry, I didn't waste a trip to Europe. I did do some tourist things. I got there a day and a half before the event, enough time to get on the time zone and then see the city a little bit. Shout out to Tomasz Vilcek, who's a local magic player and also a local tour guide and also a local history teacher and he was a very cool person to walk us around tell us the stuff that's kind of off the beaten path he gave us a lot of insight into both historical and modern political situations in prague and i took about twenty thousand steps that day we walked for like five hours through the city and he had a lot of cool stuff to say don't worry i did do this but it was on a day during the day 
not till 6 a.m. We spent a whole day before the tournament doing that, and it was very awesome. But I got to bed early and was up early to eat breakfast and caffeinate before the event. The event, by the way, was over 700 players. Look at this picture. This is amazing. The last time I was... Oh, no, that's not true. I was going to say the last time I was in Europe playing Legacy, but I've actually been back a couple times since. But the first time I was in Europe to play Legacy was Grand Prix Madrid 2010. That was an event that broke 2,000 players for the first time in Magic's history. There weren't enough chairs in the venue because nobody there was it was unprecedented. And that was a Legacy event as well. European Legacy community is awesome. And this was a full house for Legacy. Round one, I got paired against four color red beans. Basically, instead of my Black Splash, they had four Theralingus, which turned out to be a pretty good card. Surprise. And it turned out he was also a Patreon subscriber who had been messaging me the night before asking about my sideboard plans for control mirrors. So uh, off to a good start. Knew my whole list, knew everything. We had a really long game where... It really did come down to just the Monarch grinding slightly ahead uh, of where I was able to keep up. And he came out just ahead in extra turns. It was a very long match, back and forth. Took every minute on the clock and then some. And started out a 1-10 in a round tournament. Going to be a long day. I beat Merfolk in round 2. Merfolk used to be able to outgrind blue decks because they just had like Silver Gull Adapt and ways to pull slightly ahead of one-for-one -one exchanges. Cavern of Souls blanks your counter spells. That's virtual card advantage. But once you stick a Beanstalk, and then you have Leyline Binding, kill your thing, draw a card, etc. I, no offense to my opponent, but this match was not close. I was on the Onzi D stream for round three. Shout out to Onzi D, Honorog Doss, by the way. If you care about watching Legacy get played, on Twitch, in the world. You should go subscribe to Honorog's Patreon. Give him some money. He travels the world and spends two to four days at a time hunched over a little desk, making sure that things get coordinated and sent out to the world. And he's kind of the only one really doing it. There's a number of backpack streamers, but he's the only one with a professional rig really out there making it happen at a high quality level. Please go support him. I was on his stream for round three. I got paired against Mardu Yori on Taxes, and I got crushed. Death on Taxes has splashed red or black, historically, or been mono-white. This opponent was splashing both, which means they had access to every single wild little sideboard or main deck tutor bullet that the archetype has ever considered playing. Uh, over our two games, I saw Magus of the Moon, which just obliterated me in game one. Orcish Bowmaster showed up at a time where it was pretty annoying. And on the final turn of the game, I lost to Canoptic uh, Bug Swarm. I don't know. <laughs> Look that card up. Uh, Canoptic is definitely the first word. I don't know the whole name. But it's a 1-1 a one -one for 4 that exiles your graveyard and makes a bunch more bugs. That card blew me out out of an Aether Vial, and she made a pretty big mistake in this match. I think I played our game two actually pretty horrendously. The first mistake I made is they had a turn two Stoneforge Mystic, and I had two Swords of Plowshares in my hand, and they tutored Sword of Light and Shadow. And I was, and my thought process was, okay, they probably already have Cauldra, because you wouldn't just get Sword of Light and Shadow first, especially with no cards in your graveyard. So I identified that they probably already had a more desirable equipment in hand. But then I decided to Swords to Plowshares the Germ, like let them commit to putting it in, rather than just stranding it in their hand forever. And I didn't plow it. And then over the next multiple, the next several turns, they put in Batter Skull, and then put in Cauldra, and then put in the Sword of Light and Shadow. And then at that point, I was out of plows. And the other big mistake I made was... I cast a Witherbloom command where I wanted to pick up a land, but I didn't want to mill myself because death Yorian Texas frequently comes down to decking, and they frequently can't use their graveyard. So I have a play pattern of mill you, and I pick up a land when I choose the, the mill and land mode on Witherbloom command. 
Well, I milled them, despite knowing that they had already tutored for Sword of Light and Shadow, which Raised Dead is one of the triggers on Sword of Light and Shadow. And over the next, like, four or five turns, they ended up picking up two creatures that I put in the graveyard for them. And they just would not have had access to those if I didn't mill them and would have had fewer cards going forward. So there was a big misuse of implied information, which is I should have just bought the Stoneforge Mystic. And then there was a, a small failure to adjust to new information, which is I shouldn't mill them because they have sort of light and shadow. So I played this matchup pretty poorly, and my opponent played great, and their deck was very cool, and they crushed me. Brief aside to shout out everyone who came to say hi and take selfies and sign islands and ponders and stuff. There were so many people there that they said it was their first Eternal Weekend. They discovered it in the last couple of years from my stuff, and they wouldn't have been there without me. Multiple people said they practice English listening to my content. Like that's that's a thing that obviously my American fans don't need to do, but very cool to hear that just coming from around the world. There was a group there from Peru, even came from even further away than I did, and just uh, they, I didn't know I had fans in Peru. That was very cool to meet them, and shout out to all of those people. Super nice, and it was great. I met probably 50, 60 people that I signed cards or took selfies with, and. Thanks to 3 for 1 for bringing me out, because they made that possible for those people and for me. Round 4, I played against Team of Rhinos, which can be a tricky matchup. They do put a lot of pressure on very early, but in Game 3, I had like the whole engine online, multiple beans, Triumph from St. Catherine, looping, Force of Will, you draw two cards, Leila Bidek, draw two cards, blah, 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 blah. It just, oh, Game 3 was not close. If I remember correctly, they went all in on a turn one Blood Moon, but I had the Force, and it took them a while to dig out, and then I just had everything online by the time they, they started doing anything. I had to get some food, uh, stay, stay hydrated, keep eating, don't let yourself get tired, don't let yourself get hungry. And I'm already dead in the tournament, but I don't want to like feel bad, because I still plan to play it out for a while. And uh, the food bar was cash only, and they did not accept Euro. The Czech Republic has their own currency, it's Czech crowns, and almost everyone at the event was from other places in Europe. And so, no cash, no euros, and then they also yelled at me in Czech for not having exact change in crowns. And uh, that was just like one of those fun moments where I was like, I don't know what you want me to do here. We don't share a language, this is the money I have, it exceeds the cost of the thing, please give it to me. And eventually got my, my lunch sausage out of them. Round five, I defeated creative technique combo. Uh, game two, I, I lost game one because the matchup is just really tough without sideboard cards. And then game two, I curved Lavinia into Damping Sphere plus Wasteland. And I thought I was just set when I had the Lavinia. And turns out there's a new dinosaur that you could basically channel a lightning bolt a creature and they killed Lavinia with that but the Damping Sphere held the line long enough for me to win and then uh, game 3 I also Damping Speared them Damping Sphere is such a cool card in my SCG Pittsburgh list this was two Lavinias and then after that event I switched it to a Damping Sphere plus a Lavinia first of all Lavinia is legendary so if you draw both it's bad where if you draw both of these it's probably the nuts and stack them on top of each other I also expected Cloud Post in this tournament. That's a popular deck in Europe in general, and going way over the top of these four color control decks is a great way to farm us. And Damping Sphere is great there. Damping Sphere is really good versus Storm as well, because Lavinia, if your opponent casts a Veil of Summer, then they can start spamming their zero drops through Lavinia, and she doesn't counter them because she does read counter that spell. Damping Sphere just beats that, though. They have to actually remove this thing to win. But Damping Sphere, a very cool piece of tech, came up big here. The official Bosch and Roll Island Ponder Keep shirt is now available for pre-order through Coalesce Apparel and will release in early December. These will sell out and take time to restock. The holidays are coming up fast. Place your pre-orders for yourself and the Bosch and Roll fans in your life today. Coalesce is the best magic apparel on the market with awesome new designs coming out all the time. Use code Bosch and Roll at checkout for 10% off your order at coalesceapparel.shop.
Round six, I played against a fan who I had met earlier and we had talked about our decks already, which comes with the territory of both posting my decks on Patreon and just being generally willing to talk to people about stuff. While I am serious about playing in and winning these tournaments, I'm also not so serious that I'm going to be like, no, that's a secret. Walk away from me. You know, when someone nice comes up and wants to talk about the tournament. They were on four colored beans with the red splash, and I actually made a mistake here. In my deck, my triome is the Jund one, Zeotora's Proving Ground. And I that's different from my Pittsburgh list as well, because SCG Pittsburgh, I had a Xander's Lounge, and Xander's Lounge plus Savannah gives you the five land types. But you can't ponder and then lay line binding off of Savannah, Ze Savannah and Xander's Lounge, because your blue source comes into play tap. Proving Ground gives you the five with Tundra, so you can turn one Tundra Ponder, turn two Fetch Proving Ground, and Leyline Bind something with the Tundra from turn one. And I just like that sequence better than what Xander's Lounge offered me. But in this game we're talking about, I led on the wrong Fetch. I had a Polluted Delta and a Flooded Strand in my opening hand, and I was like, okay, I'm going to get Proving Ground on one, cast Beans on turn two, cast another Beanstalk on turn three, then Leyline Binding, draw two cards... That's what I had mapped out, and then I just looked down and realized I had played Flood Strand, which does not fetch Proving Ground, and then I had to just play off curve, and it was a little awkward. Still got the win, but got to be really careful about that stuff. Round seven, the the preordained twelve post matchup that we knew was out there. I had Damping Sphere. I play Wasteland. I have a chance. But by the time I drew Damping Sphere, my opponent actually just had 12 lands in play and was like, okay, cast Ulamog. <laughs> and just ate my Damping Sphere with an Ulamog trigger off of 12 actual lands. So it didn't show up early enough. They had plenty going on. And uh, without dedicated hate, you do not win this match. And that's what happened. This is one of the coolest things that I did this weekend. Some Austrian folks from the Austrian Legacy League who have been longtime fans and supporters of this channel. One of my first donation decks I ever accepted was from Philip from the Austrian Legacy League. And we got Chino, who sent me a bunch of lists, and some other folks I believe I've talked to. But they feel very strongly about me. I feel strongly about them. And they had me sign this Island Ponder Koval of Care Keep for their LGS. They're going to frame this and hang it. And it's just insane to me that... There's going to be a framed depiction of my catchphrase in Magic Cards in a country that, to this date, I have not been to. But that's just uh, the reach of this game, and I don't know. This just means a lot. I, I don't. I hope you understand that without me articulating it too much. And then round eight, the final round that I played, it was a ten-round tournament. But at four-four, I had had enough. It was also very hot in the venue. It was in this really beautiful, big, crazy hotel that had all sorts of decorations and they had a food bar, like I mentioned before, and it, it was like a good venue, but the actual tournament hall itself was hotter than hell, honestly. It was like the eighth circle of hell in there, and I was just physically cooked by the end of the day and buried in the tournament, so I, I stopped after this round. But I played against Mono White Yori on Taxes that I learned to my dismay was full of ephemerates as well. And this guy was actually really funny. Uh, during the pre-match conversation where you're like, hey, I'm Brian, where are you from? And like, just normal chatter. Uh, he was like, I'm from Sweden. Chinese guy. <laughs> he, he like whispered it. I'm a Chinese guy. And that was just, I don't know. That was just a very funny thing. But this guy was very nice and... Uh, his accent was very charming, and I remember just being lulled into near sleep, comatose, by the way that he spoke and how quickly he destroyed me. Ephemerate might seem kind of weird in Death and Taxes. Like, I mean, obviously, like the card has been seen in shells like that before, but my opponent had Ephemerate every time I cast a removal spell. So every removal spell I cast basically three for one to me. And I died so fast. This was not even close. Opponent, very nice, though. Very nice Chinese guy from Sweden. <laughs> and here is the nice picture of my deck laid out all in front of me. One of my rules for tournaments is don't lose to death and taxes because it is a popular deck. Like I 
don't think death and taxes is bad. I'm not like, you know, careers on the line. If you lose to death and taxes, you got to sell your cards. That's not what I'm saying. I respect the deck. And I also recognize it's a deck that doesn't play any reserveless cards. So it's popular and approachable, uh, both by legacy masters and by people who are new to the format. And I got crushed both the times I played against death and taxes. Both of them are weird builds. The one was Mardu and the other was ephemerate based. And I did play bad in the first one, like I identified. So, but I want to think about how I can improve that matchup. It's important enough to me that I might just play a Dreadum Knight or something just really targeted at that sort of archetype because, you know, it's one that you have to beat if you want to win a tournament. And like I said before, fourth color might be too much. I'll be working on this on Pittsburgh for, for Eternal Weekend Pittsburgh. And I have a four color Cath Beans working list that is accessible through my Patreon that whatever I'm currently thinking about is going to be happening on that list. If you're interested in watching that process unfold. This video is sponsored by Moxfield.com, the easiest way to build magic decks online. Moxfield supports over 30 formats, including Legacy and everything else you'll see on this channel. There's multiple customizations so you can interact with your deck how you want. Views such as text, grid, or stacks. And groupings like type, subtype, color, color identity, even artist. The site offers light mode, dark mode, and so much more. However you want to see your deck, Moxfield can provide it for you. Follow my Moxfield to keep up with the channel and what I'm playing in paper. I'll see you there. And then there's day two, Vintage. This event I was very excited for, and I'm excited for the Pittsburgh one as well. But this event, in Pittsburgh, we usually get about 300 people, which is a nine-round event. Here, there was just over 100, which is a seven round event and a seven round event for the prizes offered, like the Black Lotus painting is one of the best EV tournaments that you're ever going to get. And I was going to play anyway, but I'm not I'm not just an EV hound, but the value of money paid out versus players in was so high for this event. We were all very excited about it. And my deck for this tournament was Atraxa Oath, which if you've been following my content, you know that I 5 0 with twice in a row and then went 3-2 in my final testing league, losing to two Atraxa mirrors where they had tech and I didn't for the mirror. So my list for Eternal Weekend, this came directly from Justin Gennari. I am actually level one. He and I had been messaging. And after my third Oath League, where I lost to Oath decks that had tech in them for the mirror, I messaged Justin, who was already in Europe. He spent some time in Germany before popping over to Prague for the event. And I was like, hey, I think I want Thought Seizes in the 75 for the mirror. And he was like, LOL, I made that change yesterday. Good thought. And... This is just his list from his Patreon. If you care about Vintage, you should probably be following Justin over there. But yeah, this deck is just great. Oath of Druids is the core engine. The only creatures in your deck, or in your main deck, are Atraxa. Then Forbidden Orchard can give your opponent creatures if they don't have any of their own. But if they are naturally a creature deck, like Mono White Initiative, one of the top decks in the format, Blue Black Bowmaster Luris Control, one of the top decks in the format. All these decks are full of creatures and they're pretty bad at answering Oath of Druids and they're pretty bad at catching up once you start triggering Atraxes. You get to play a bunch of Power Nine. You're also a Tinker deck. You can Tinker out Bolus' Citadel and then that just is a card draw engine of its own. You've got four Show and Tells on top of the four Oaths and a Flash, which is restricted and we're playing as many copies as we're allowed. Just tons of ways to leverage Atraxa, both in your deck and in your hand. And once you start triggering this thing, just giant Vigilance lifelink monster. Needs no introduction. Plus, you're the best Oko deck. And Oko is a messed up card that is basically only legal and vintage at this point. Too good for every other competitive format. And Oko is super messed up because it does things like turn your Graph Digger's Cage into an Elk. Now, not only do you not have a Graph Digger's Cage, but you do have a creature that triggers Oath of Druids. Just the perfect thing. And then in the Oath Mirror, 
is having three Okos. In every list plays Okos, a lot of them are on two Oko, one Narset. But Justin correctly identified the three Oko is correct, because just putting this thing into play and nickel and diming your opponent, because in the, in the mirror, you can't play an Oath, because your opponent, it's symmetrical. Your opponent might trigger it first. You can't play a show and tell reliably because they have as many giant bangers as you do. So it really comes down to being like Oko control, bug Oko control, and just having more Okos than the mirror. Plus, it's just a great card in all sorts of matchups. And that's this deck. If you're looking to run a CEDH or 1v1 tournament, Eminence Gaming has your back with Command Tower. With Command Tower's intuitive tournament manager dashboard, you can handle deckless submission and player management with just a few clicks. Players just need to scan the event's QR code for access to the full tournament bracket, including seamless pairings and real-time standing updates. Take the guesswork out of tournament organizing. Try Command Tower for your next event. On the morning of the Vintage Tournament, it was actually really awesome. Our 13-person Airbnb, we all broke up into different groups. Some of us went to breakfast one place, some of us went another, some of us went another. We left at all different times. But when it was time to show up to the tournament, it was like my Uber pulled up, and then an Uber pulled up next to me, and then another one pulled up next to them. And it was just all 13 of us, and we all just climbed out of the three cars at the exact same moment. It was like a scripted thing, and it was amazing. I beat Oath in round one, which is a really important thing to beat because not only is Oath one of the best decks and what's going to be one of the most popular decks, it also is a shit show of a mirror match. Like I just said, you can't really Oath, you can't really show and tell. Those are your engines. You're relying on Oko and Tinker to win the game. It's really important to have a good plan for those. And the Thought Season is the extra Oko. It all came in big. And uh, I took a little dig at Justin here. The piece of tech that he talked me into on the very last night was this Bayou. All of my testing lists had three crop two C, and Justin switched one of the Cs to a Bayou, and then we moved the fetch lands around to support that. And the Bayou, the thought process here is sometimes you need to thought seize your opponent and then cast Oath off of just one actual land and trop. And C, don't do that. You get one or the other. But by you, you actually can curve Thoughtseize into Oath with like an off-color Mox or, or a Strip Mine or something. But that comes at the cost of sometimes you keep one landers with like Ancestral Recall or Mystical Tutor. Or in the case of this hand that I'm referencing right here now, my opening hand was Bayou Mana Crypt Show and Teletraxa. Just couldn't send it because I had the Bayou. After the tournament, I'm not sure if that's right. I'm sure Justin will do a better breakdown than me. Justin made top eight of this event, was undefeated until the top eight. And I, I am sure he will be doing a breakdown. It'll, it's probably already live. He'll probably turn around faster than I will. Round two, I lost to Beseech Storm. The major weakness of Oath as a strategy is to faster combo decks. Because while we do have forces and interaction and stuff, we also have a bunch of, like, Oko, Atraxa, Show and Tell, the Oath itself. Just a bunch of stuff that isn't high impact. And our combo involves passing the turn, giving them a creature, and then we trigger the Atraxa. And then we have to pass the turn again and try to attack with the Atraxa. And, like, it's just a very different than a dedicated Make You Dead combo deck. And this has always, throughout history been a soft spot for Oath decks. And exactly the thing I just said came up because I came, I won the die roll without knowing the matchup. I kept a hand that had turn two Oath, turn three Oath, where it was like, I can force check you on the first one. If you pass the force check, I just get you again on turn three. But I didn't have any protection of my own. And they just went like land, bunch of mana, time walk, bunch more mana, you're dead comboed me out and uh i didn't they they got a free one past me because i just bet that i was a better or faster deck than them and i was wrong and then in game three we both kept super grindy slow hands but they had turn one sensei's top and i didn't while we were both played drago for about 10 turns their drago was sculpted they got the best one out of three cards every time and i just had to draw normally and at the end i, I had a win attempt plus 
two counter spells, and they had three counter spells, then untap, make a win attempt. So they just had one thing better than me at the end of that, and it was because they were able to sculpt the whole time, and I couldn't. Down three, I beat White Initiative. This is one of the decks that you play Oath to have a positive matchup against. It's a very popular matchup. It's approachable to non-vintage players. It's also very good if you are a vintage player. Anyone who in the past has been into any sort of hate bear deck or any sort of prison shops deck, this play pattern would appeal to them. And it's an important one to be able to beat. And this one came down to a game three tinker for Portal to Phyrexia. Opponent had three creatures at play, and my life total was low, and one of them was Containment Priest, and Portal to Phyrexia beats all of the normal hate for your deck, and it's a Wrath of God, and then you get to take all their creatures back one by one and gain the initiative as you after you kill off their creature and reanimate their initiative creature. And Portal Phyrexia just carried that matchup. Once again, taking care of myself, remembering to eat and drink. At breakfast, we went to like a sandwich stop, and I grabbed an extra sandwich and put it in my bag for later. It was time to eat it. Then round four, lost a tough one to... Jewel Paradoxical Outcome, which is another one of those faster combo decks. They're trying to force check you. They're trying to make you dead. And in our game three, my plan was to tinker for Null Rod, which might seem weird, but their deck can't really beat a Null Rod in any normal way. And it shuts down basically all of their engines. They're a one ring deck, the Jewel itself, just everything they're trying to do is an artifact. You have not one Null Rod in your deck, and Tinker can go get it. I had the Tinker. I had lots of mana. I got a successful Atraxa trigger, and I missed on a Mox in the look at 10 for Atraxa, and the next two draw steps, and uh, the two draw steps that happened before that. So it was like 13 or 14 looks at any Mox that was in my deck, and I just simply did not find one. And then they were able to get ahead with a one ring and kill me. Where I was looking at the the path to Null Rod the whole time, and it didn't work out. Round five, I had sat next to my opponent before, and I knew what they were on. They were on four color Luris with like Ragavan and Questing Druid, and probably Deathrite Shamans in there, but basically just a creature deck. And because I knew the matchup, I kept a hand with two lands and. Or it was land, mox, three oaths. <laughs> and I was just like, turn one oath of druids, they forced it. Turn two oath of druids, they forced it. Turn three oath of druids, resolved, and then they died. Sometimes it is that simple. That's one of the draws to oath. While you do have to play some awkward cards in your deck to make it all work, the payoff is that some decks actually just can't beat the namesake card if it resolves. Then I lost to white initiative. This one was a heartbreaker. I actually did... Tinker into Phyrexian Portal, or Portal to Phyrexia, and they had a super reactive hand. They were able to solitude the first two creatures that I brought back out of their graveyard, and then on the final turn, like, I had the initiative, they had one card in their hand, I had Force of Will in my hand, and five mana to spend on it. Like whatever they cast, I could just force it. It ends up in the graveyard. Then I reanimate it. Then I'm too far ahead for them to do anything. But they drew for their turn, and then they played Cavern on Elemental. And then the last card in their hand was Solitude. And they were able to Solitude my blocker. And because all the removal was Exile-based, there was nothing to reanimate, and they got over the finish line. That, well, that one really was just a, did you draw Cavern or not on this final turn of the game? And they did. And because this was a seven-round event, I just played out the last one. And once again, I defeated Oath in the Mirror. My turn one in Game 3 was Black Lotus, Tropical Island, Oko with Flusterstorm backup. And like I said before, Oko is just really important in the Mirror. And I turn one that buddy with protection and pretty much just carried it from there. So this tournament in review, even though 4-3 is not a great record... Beat the two Oath Mirrors, which is something we went out to do. I beat two out of three creature deck opponents, which is something we came out to do. And the one I lost came down to just like a three outer that they drew on the last turn where it was possible. So like, I think I, I win that one a lot of the time. 
obviously I lost this one. I'm not saying their win doesn't count, but like just as far as deck selection, looking forward to Pittsburgh goes, I beat two of the three creature matchups. I beat both of the Oath Mirrors. And then I lost to the two faster combo matchups. That's kind of how we drew it up, basically. Like, that's almost like, other than that one loss to Mono White Initiative, that's kind of like we just looked at what our decks were and who had the, the deck building advantage and then wrote, signed the slip without actually playing. There was only one upset throughout the tournament. Everything else happened how it's supposed to. I'm pretty happy with the choice. I'm pretty happy with the list. Still not entirely sold on the Bayou. Go watch Justin's recap. He'll tell you if it's good or not. There were a couple times where it was bad. I didn't specifically experience the point where you thought season to Oath, but I imagine it comes up. This deck is great. It did not make the finals. Uh, the finals was Esper Tinker versus Blue Black Luris, and Justin was in top eight with this same 75. I didn't play against any traditional shops decks. I played against the PO jewel shops, which is different than like Arcbound Ravager, uh, Sphere of Resistance kind of shop stuff, which is a great matchup for this. I didn't play against any bizarre decks, which are good matchups for this. So the other two pillars of the format that were just not present in my matchup spread, I would have been happy to play against. I think this deck is good if you know how to play the mirror and know what's going on. It's hard to argue with this choice for a major vintage event. And that was my adventure in Prague. Beautiful city, beautiful opportunity, awesome eternal scene over in Europe. And thank you again to 3 for 1 Trading for making it possible for me to be out there. Everyone make sure to check out their Black Friday sales. Go buy cards from them so I can keep going to events on their, on their name. It works out for everyone. And then you get tournament reports like this one. I appreciate you all for watching this, and I'll see you at Eternal Week in Pittsburgh.